Usually the things that kept us safe as youngsters will destroy our relationships in the present. There is no such thing. It's not true. It doesn't exist. There is no long-term behavior change. There's no long-term healing that can be done in isolation. The doctors and lawyers and preachers and college presidents, those who quote unquote made are some of the loneliest people on the planet, right? And so that story becomes part of our body. Dear young married couple, we worked with a lot of people who think that because they came from a good home, that their current problems aren't associated. And some people, even from bad homes, neglect looking at their past and looking at their stories as a possible solution for changing their future. We got to talk with author, speaker, and mental health specialist, Dr. John Deloney, about this very topic. Own your past, change your future. Dr. Deloney is a national best-selling author, and he also has a podcast of his own, The Dr. John Deloney Show. He holds two PhDs, one in counselor education and supervision, and the other in higher education. So he's part of the Ramsey team, and we will link his resources in the show notes for you. We got so much out of the interview today with him. Yes, some practical stuff, some challenges, and just some good laughs. So. Oh yeah, he's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> so join in, it's gonna be awesome, and um, open yourself up a little bit so maybe you can start this change in your future. Welcome Dr. John Deloney to the podcast. We're so honored that you're here. Yes. Man, this is such a, such a gift, I'm grateful. Aww. Man, well, we are excited to talk about um, stories and how these affect your life. And uh, man, I'm just, let's get into it. Let's dive right in. So first, man, we've heard you tell some incredible stories of your own, and I'm sure we'll get into some of that today. Um, but before we talk about how stories have healing power, talk to us first about the pain. Why are people hurting so badly, especially right now in a post-pandemic world? Oh, man, I think. I think coming out of the pandemic, um, the, the, the greatest gift we could give our neighbors in the pandemic was to not be around them, to uh, isolate from them, right? That mm -hmm. isolation became a, like the, the chief virtue of our time. Right. Mm -hmm. And our bodies are co-regulated. And so they can only work in the presence of other people. And that's not like woo-woo nonsense. That's just yep. physiological. That's just science. And it's science. It yep. to be with, uh, with the other people. And so- Number one, we are pumping, firing these stories in our heads about how the end of time's here. It's all coming down and they're trying to kill you. And no, they're trying to kill you. And if you look back at the pillars of our society, one of the narratives that was spun up, whether you believe it or not, was that the government was trying to kill you or control you. The education system was trying to kill you. Churches that were reopening were trying to kill you. Everyone, all these, <laughs> like the, the, the bedrocks of our communities were all trying to kill us. <laughs> Right. Not to mention, if you were six or nine hearing these messages, your teachers are trying, they want you dead. So mm -hmm. we've got these stories that are rattling around on every media channel, on every swipe of social media, mm -hmm. everywhere. Every cup of mm -hmm. coffee we share with somebody, there's another, it's all coming down. Yeah. And then you've got the reality that um, we're supposed to be isolating from one another. I got to I got to be by myself. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know economically right now, like I don't know, I, gas has tripled, right? Yeah. Food has gotten really expensive. And so- right. The, this isn't like an Instagram thing anymore. This is super real. I don't know right. how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat this month. And so you have this confluence of all of the stuff, but I think it all sits on this coming out of this loneliness. And we really have lost the skill set to sit in other people's discomfort, to laugh with other people, to be around other people. And we don't know what to do. And our bodies mm. are screaming at us. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Yeah. And you combine the stories that we heard during the pandemic with the stories that everyone hears growing up. Right. right? And it was a recipe for a lot of mental health issues. Right. And you, you and I both saw that. Um, yeah. <laughs> yes. So, right? That's what we exactly. Yeah. Yes. The, the stories that, so we talk about the stories we were, we grew up with. I like to, yeah. to cut them up in the stories we were told. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And the stories that um, we have the stories that we were born into, mm -hmm. the stories we were told, and then the stories of the things that happened. Yeah. And together, those three stories become the stories that we tell ourselves. And so, here's yeah. a very simple way, way to do that. 
Some people grew up in a home where God wasn't real. A God was a fairy tale. Some people grew up in a home where God has one, one job. And that is to make sure everything in your life is perfect. If you just do it right, you will have mm-hmm. a great APR on your mortgage. You will get a shiny new car. Your dog will be healthy and your parents will live to be a 10,000 years old. Like God's chief job is to make you make your life great. Yes. And then some people were born into the house <laughs> where God is watching you. And if you screw up one time, he can't wait mm. to punish and torture and separate himself for you. And he's going to do it for eternity. There is no end. That's it. Right. And so think about that narrative to yeah. a six-year-old. You either mm-hmm. tell them, hey, the creator of the universe, um, all he wants to do is to make your life great. Or you tell a six-year-old, if you step out of line, there is an all-knowing, all-powerful being that sees and hears every thought you have and will send you to eternity of torture. If my neighbor told my kid that, I'd probably <laughs> go to jail, right? Except <laughs> that. That's abuse. Yeah. Or, hey, six-year-old, um, there's nothing. Make the best of it, man. Make good choices because uh, we're on our own, right? And so that yeah. story becomes part of our body. Yes. Yep. It's, it's the cortisol and the adrenaline that spin up when we're scared or we think we're tethered into this almighty thing, right? So it becomes mm-hmm. part of our bodies. And then you fast forward and you become 25 and for the, your mom has a heart attack and passes mm-hmm. away. Your best friend gets in a car wreck. All those stories that we knew and we were told that we were born into, reinforced by ministers and our neighbors and our parents, they become the stories that we tell ourselves. And suddenly mom died because I wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. Or my son or daughter passed away because God needed another angel. What? He could only accomplish his goals at my expense, right? Or, right. So these things become a part of us. And you see really quickly how it just cascades into mania. And then all of a sudden YouTube shows up and it's like, we've got another suggestion. It could be the government's trying to kill you. Right. (laughs) And so these stories become part of our bodies and our bodies are always trying to keep us safe. That's what our bodies are trying to do. Yeah. So when we start telling ourselves that we're not good enough, that we're not loved, that we're uh, someone's after us trying to kill us, uh, it it has a direct effect on how we treat other people, how close we can get to others in Mm. relationship how we can plug into jobs when things get hard, how we can overcome stuff when we're married and we get tension in mm. our marriages or our kids are weirdos. Mm. It All of that plays into our bodies are responding over and over and over. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And we all sit here and listen and say like, how sad is that that someone would say those things to a six-year-old? But everyone listening. <laughs> to her six-year-old. <laughs> right. And everyone listening is saying it to that six-year-old inside of them. Yes. You know, and, and it, it does impact absolutely everything that you say, the decisions you make, how you interact in conversations, relationships. Yeah. So what are, what are the telltale signs for people listening right now? Okay. Like, yeah. yes, we, you know, I grew up with that. Like I heard some of my story and what you were just now saying. <laughs> yeah. How do I know that I need to maybe look at my stories a little closer to figure out how a better path going forward. Cause you know, people look at the past and say, Oh, the past is just the past. Like, can we just leave in the past and go forward? Like, what do you say to those people? So, well, they're wrong. <laughs> that was easy. Uh, they're incorrect. Um, so can I be, is it okay to be, um, I, I I'm, uh, I'm a, like I, I, I teach Sunday school. I go to Sunday school. Like I'm a church going guy, but can I be critical of church for a second? Is that okay? Go for it. Do it. Um, <laughs> Both the church and the mental health um, communities over the last couple of hundred years, quite honestly, but especially in the last 50 to 100, we've told ourselves, we've been told, and I'm a member of the mental health community too, that if you will just get the right thoughts in the right order, then you're, that's what wellness is. And so you just need to think about things in the right way. Mm. Or if you're a person of faith, you just need to think the things in the right order, and then your, your spiritual relationship with, with God will, will roll itself out on a red carpet. Mm-hmm. And the other side of that, and it's good, it's good to explore our thinking. Why are we having these thoughts? Where do these things come from? Oh, that's really good. But right. it implicitly separates us from the single most important tool we were given for detecting safety, for detecting whether we are whole. And it's not our thinking. Our emotions and feelings lie to us. That's not their job is not mm-hmm. to give us data. I mean, not to give us facts. It's to give us info, to give us data. Right, right. Those are two different things. 
the thing that we're disconnected from that the church has not done a great job of is we're disconnected from our bodies. And so to answer your question, when my wife, when the car pulls up in the driveway and I hear the tires, on, we have a gravel, long gravel driveway. We live out in the woods. Um, when the tires drive up and my heart starts beating and I start picking my stuff up to just go somewhere else, mm-hmm. I have to stop and listen to my body. Why are you, where are you going? This is your house. You love her and she loves you. Right. Oh, when I was a kid and mom came home and I heard the tires, I knew I better just disappear. And our body remembers and puts a GPS pin in that story. And it plays throughout our lives. And then my wife come home and there's nobody there. And she's like, John, where are you? And I was like, I'm upstairs. And then she begins to feel, why did he leave? Yeah. And then that reminds her of a story of her dad left. And oh, yeah. that sets off a rejection narrative that I don't have. You, know, you see what I'm saying? So, My story, absolutely. your story. And then they, we, oh, fly, yeah. we fly right past each other. Mm-hmm. And so then she tries to solve it by getting closer to me, which makes my alarm sound louder. And I then move further away, which sounds her rejection alarm. And now we're doing a dance and we wake up seven years later and we have two kids and I don't know who you are. And I really don't even like you. Yeah. Right. And it's all because our bodies are simply responding to these stories that we knew. And so you cannot move forward until you can learn to hear your body, what it's saying to you. And the word that I've chosen to use instead of, um, uh, you know, like think about is just be curious, mm-hmm. ask so yourself, good. why is my body taking off on me? Right yeah. Now? Mm. Or yeah. I, um, something as simple yet as uncomfortable. I'm about to take my shirt off in my own bathroom and I hear somebody coming in the door. <gasps> Why? Yeah. I'm curious. What is it about me that's so unable to be looked at? Mm-hmm. Especially by the one person who said he or she was all right. Yep. And it's being curious about us and not blaming because our bodies want to lash out and blame to protect mm. us. Right. Right. So, right. To answer your original question, hopefully that makes sense is that we've Absolutely. got to get reconnected to the, the simple signals that our body gives us on a daily basis. So good. Mm. So get curious. Get curious about those signals. When you see data coming in, get curious about and it. Slow down. Because it's, it's about being intentional, slowing down, and being curious yeah. about my body. Why am I so mad right now? Mm-hmm. Angry right now. Am, yeah. I'm about to yell. Is this going to solve anything? Right. Yeah. I'm about to smash something. What will be accomplished by this? Right. Um, right. It's being curious about it. Yeah, mm-hmm. My heart's already racing. Mm-hmm. It's probably not a great time to go into a deep conversation with your wife. You maybe need to take a break. <laughs> Nothing will be accomplished by, by this interaction other than right. I'll burn through some of the cortisol and adrenaline that's running through my veins. And I will use my wife, I will use my husband as a, as a proverbial punching bag so yep. that I can feel a little bit less tightened up. I mm-hmm. can feel better. And none of our spouses deserve to be treated like that. And it doesn't breed connection the thing that actually will start. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Connections. What will actually start to cure a lot of the, the empty pieces that are causing yeah. that uh, outburst. The big signal for me, the big, the big tip off for me was when I learned that that part of your brain, that's always scanning the environment 24, seven, 365. Can I keep mm-hmm. you safe? I'm going to keep you safe. That it actually fires off the systems before our conscious brain is recognized. There's a threat. Oh. Right. And so you walk into a room, I, this has happened to me multiple times. I'm a big, huge guy and <laughs> I kind of just blew through life. And there's been several times, um, I, my wife and I've been dating and married for almost 25 years now. And there's been times when she said, we need to go right now. Mm. And I would say, why? And she said, there's a couple of guys over there. We need to go right now. Mm-hmm. One, she knows I'm a hothead and I'm an idiot. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, like, that's my first response, which is so juvenile and, and dumb. <laughs> <laughs> she has a GPS pin that remembers that's not safe. Let's mm. just go ahead and leave. Sure. And if, when we were young and we were married and, and I was an idiot, I'd be like, no, I listen to that implicitly. Now mm. she says, Hey, you need to stay away from this person. I'm going to stay. I'm not even going to ask questions. Sure. I just trust her. Right. Yep. Um, because her body's saying not safe. Not yeah. Safe. Yeah. yeah. Pass that info along. Right. So that GPS pin. Time. Yeah. yeah, totally. That GPS pin can serve us well. But we got to get curious about it and find out when it's not serving us well. Right. And, and Usually the things that kept us safe as youngsters will destroy our relationships in the present. Yeah. So we have to unwind those things, those little kids, that the, the mechanisms that we had to adopt as children and as teenagers to keep us safe. 
Mm-hmm. Those are the things that will, that will breed disconnection with our kids, with our spouses and at work. Mm. So mm. good. So good. Okay. So for the person listening, they're like, yeah, my body does stuff and, and I, I find myself running or I find myself fighting. Right. right. Um, what's the next step for them to, if they notice these things happening. What do they do next? Um, so back in the, I, I got done writing this book and I submitted it and um, Jennifer, she's, she's a saint. She was the woman who uh, helped edit the book. And she called and said, Hey, do you want to include this path that you have here? And I said, what are you talking about? And she goes, well, you've got a path here to being well, Do you want to call it out. And I was like, you mean like steps? And she's like, yeah, you've got some very clear steps for being well. And I was like, I do not. Number one, <laughs> number two, anyone who says like, I've got the seven steps to I automatically <laughs> just don't listen to what you <laughs> You're reductive and you're more. <laughs> I, I just don't listen. And she goes, no, that's very, very clear throughout this thing. Mm-hmm. You've identified. So when I say like, I'm about to rattle through them, but when I say like the five steps, there's no such thing as like, uh, you'll stand up on a hill and be like, oh, I'm not anxious. Right. Because <laughs> the moment you scream that your tech, your phone will buzz and say, you know, there's missiles coming right at us. And mom just had a heart attack. Right. <laughs> The goal of these five steps that emerge just in a normal, like just the way I love to to take care of people and wrestle with my own personal health is um, these are five principles that you can put in your back pocket and life will continue to come at you. Mm -hmm. Somebody you love will undoubtedly, 100% of us listening to this will get cancer. 100% of us will have friends whose marriages implode. 100% Mm -hmm. of us will have people that we love who cheat on somebody else. Like that will just be Mm -hmm. part of our life. Right. And so these principles help us roll and continue to to step forward in the day. Right. Okay. So So let's go with step one. Yes. Yes. So you've got to own those stories. As they come up, you've got to take ownership of them. Okay. And we've talked enough about that. Like you've got to understand, oh, when I was a kid, mom would get really upset and would yell and scream. And I learned to not say certain things to make mom mad, which meant I learned to be responsible for the adults in my home, which is mm-hmm. the responsibility that no child should have. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now I'm 40 and I'm trying to carefully couch things. So my supervisor, who's got an attitude problem at work, well, oh, not my job anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. So we're going to own these stories and they come up over a course of our lifetime. Mm-hmm. That's, that's part of the adventure of life is to figure yeah. these stories out. Um, the second thing is, is you have to, and this is hard. You have to acknowledge reality. Mm-hmm. You didn't mean to be married and be six months, uh, have been, have slept together once in six months, mm-hmm. but you got busy and you gained weight and you felt uncomfortable and you got mad and you were exhausted. And suddenly we, you have to own, here's where we yeah. are. Mm. Right. When we're, when you're trying to get out of debt, here's how much money I owe other people, yep. the credit card companies, you got to put all in one piece of paper, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't mean to gain a hundred pounds and here I am. It got to right. own reality. Somebody treated me differently just because of this color of my skin and they continue to do it. Mm-hmm. Somebody, I, my, I was born into abject poverty and I don't know how money works. You yeah. have to acknowledge reality. And if you can get people there, mm-hmm. if I can look in the mirror and say, this is the honest truth of where mm-hmm. I am then I can ask that one terrifying, scary question. What am I going to do now? What yeah. comes right. Why do you think it is that people don't acknowledge reality? Like when they sit there kind of in denial. Because often acknowledging reality means I have to say I failed at something. Right. I have to acknowledge my husband's cheating on me. Mm-hmm. I have to acknowledge I love my parents and I have this picture in my head of what, what, um, Thanksgiving was going to look like with my kids. And it was going to be all beautiful. And my dad was abusive yeah. mm-hmm. and my mom just sat there and let it happen. Mm-hmm. And so we, it blows up our pictures mm-hmm. that we are desperately trying to hold together with duct tape mm-hmm. and string and bailing wire. And so we, it's easier just to wallpaper over. And we live in a culture that just hands us distraction after distraction after distraction. Right. Right. The truth is Netflix knows you better than you do. Mm-hmm. And they just do. And they will tell you, um, you're gonna want to watch this series next. We mm-hmm. know you so well by what you scroll, how long you how long you look at something, what you review, what you right. watch. You're gonna want to watch this. Yeah. Uh, the guy at uh, at Amazon, it just shows up, right? You're gonna want to buy this. Okay, <laughs> you know, you're like so, you're right. <laughs> that's right. So we've automated our lives. Yep. Everything is about distraction, mm-hmm. and we are unable to say, "I'm not being the husband that I should be." Mm. Yeah. I yell at my wife and I've got to stop. 
or I've been mm-hmm. yelling at my kids and all I'm doing is making them terrified to come to their own home. I got to wow. stop. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And so I've got to own reality and it's just hard. It is a hard, yeah. hard one. Or I love working at this place and they have policies that make it that I can't accept. They're so dehumanizing. I can't be a part of this thing, mm. whatever this thing is. Right? Yep. And so when you get there, then you get into the, what am I going to do now? Okay. And the, what am I going to do now is um, it's hard because <laughs> it never stops. Yeah. And there's, we've been sold this myth that like, once you get to quote unquote here, you're good. Once you make a hundred thousand dollars a year. Ah, and as soon as you get a hundred grand, you're like, I need to make 200 grand <laughs> a million dollars. You're like, I need probably need to make 5 million. Like there is there, there, yep. right. Yep. Um, and so these three really work in kind of like an infinity loop. They just okay. keep working together. Um, the first one, and it's, I think it's the most important one. There is no such thing. It's not true. It doesn't exist. There is no long-term behavior change. There's no long-term healing that can be done in isolation. We'll be right back to the interview, but first we wanted to share something that we are really excited about. So, you know, we all have those times where we don't feel super connected to our spouse and we really don't know what conversations to have to get us to that connected place. And then on top of that, we're so busy that we don't prioritize those conversations. And that's why we created the monthly live date night. And Monthly Live Date Night is every month on a Friday night for 90 minutes, 60 minutes. We focus on a topic that uh, you guys pick. And then 30 minutes, we do a QA and a and it's live where we're all together asking questions and giving answers on topics related to your marriage, your intimacy. And we share tools. Uh, We have handouts that we call homework because we want you to be there to listen and to soak in. But we really want you to take action in your marriage too. So come join us live for the next monthly live date night. Check the link in the show notes for dates and details. All right, back to the interview. Full stop with an exclamation point at the end. And often we put community, friendships, getting connected low on our list. First, I need to lose weight. And then I need to um, start being a little more adventurous in the bedroom. And then I need to get a better job. No, you have to start with other people. Mm. your it's brain beautiful. will scream for connection until you have yeah. other people. And so you can mm-hmm. white knuckle your way to that 50 pound weight loss. It will come back hundred percent. Right. You've got to have other people that walk with you in that journey. Right. right. And then it's just, a, it's just an ever, a never ending loop of working to change your thoughts and to change your actions. Mm-hmm. And some days I like today, the last thing on earth I wanted to do is get out and go to the gym, go for, I went for a long run this morning. That's the last thing I want to do. Mm-hmm. If I had relied on my feelings, I would have not felt like it. Oh. I had to change my actions and just go. I just had to go. Yeah. And there's other days, the greatest thing I can do for my body is to rest. Mm-hmm. And I really feel like exercising. I need to think through this. I've been running hard. I've been going hard. I need to take a break. I need to sit <sighs> with my kids and be with my wife. And so we're just going to continue to control our thoughts and control our actions. The big one on thoughts is I did not know that you, those were controllable. I thought I was, I was subservient to them. I thought I was a slave to my, what popped into my brain. Mm-hmm. And what the research tells us and my own experience tells me is that lightning bolt, you can't stop. That, that, that blast in there about the time he cheated on you, that time that he popped off, she smashed something that you let, that will just light, lightning bolt in your head. And then at that moment, you got a choice. Am I going to meditate on this thing? Am I going to mm-hmm. think about it? Am I going to allow my heart to start beating and my cortisol and adrenaline start running? Mm-hmm. Or am I going to say, nope? where I'm not doing this. I'm not going down that story. I'm not having an imaginary conversation with someone who's not even here. (laughs) I am going to replace that thought with something else. I'm going to go about my day. And that's people get so frustrated at me when I say that, because it sounds so trite. It's something you practice. (laughs) Curiosity and practice are the two big words. It's something you practice. And my promise is if you keep practicing, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to dwell on it. Mm -hmm. And you replace that thought with something else. Over time, your brain understands you are in control now. It doesn't have to flash with these, these memories of fear and, and scarcity and anger right. and rage because it knows you're driving. Right. It doesn't have to keep you safe because you're keeping you safe. Mm-hmm. And your default setting will shift and you'll start to see beauty and you'll start to see joy. That becomes your default setting, which is an wow. incredible transition. I love but the it. big one, the big one is you can't do life alone. That's right. Yeah. We want to dive in more deeply on that step. So you've laid out the five steps, own your stories. Number two, acknowledge reality. Number three, get connected. Number four, change your thoughts. Number five, change your actions. And folks, we encourage you get his book. It just came out. It's incredible. Own your past, change your future. 
and he lays out those five steps. But like he said earlier, it's not really like a step by step manual. <laughs> it's something you can absolutely relate with. Well, it seems like something that goes over and over and over in your daily life. Right. That I'm, I, I'm in my early 40s and something happened the other day. And I, inst- I got I got mad at a level that was completely unreasonable for the situation. And I had to loop back and say, what is my body trying to tell me? Mm. And it was, oh, my goodness. I was the exact age that my 12-year-old son is when such and such happened. Ah. And he just went bebopping through here. Mm. And I was, and it's about to happen. to. And my body had put a pin in that that said, that age, that look, this time, the situation, mm. not safe, not safe, not safe, not safe. And I started hollering at me. And so, mm. yes, I had to loop back and look at the stories. And then I had to acknowledge reality. And in this case, reality was, He's fine. He's not an idiot like I was. He's one of my knuckleheaded kids in the city. He's alone out in the woods chasing dogs and turtles and snakes out in the woods. Right. Totally different situation. I'm acknowledging reality. He's totally sick. And then okay. I can be on about my day. Right. So nice. this thing will come up and come up and come up for yep. the rest of our lives. And that's all yeah. good. Just loop back through these steps. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Let's dive into step three. So despite advanced technology and social media, People are finding themselves more lonely than ever. Wait, but they have a thousand friends on Facebook and, right. and Instagram. So they're not really lonely, well, right? Well, I love your quote that they, <laughs> they highlighted in the workbook at Summit when we were there. We have a thousand Facebook friends, but no one to help us move our couch. Yes. Right? right? So despite yeah. social media and all of the, the latest technology, you know, why would you say that connection can still be so... Um, it's just missing. It, it's it's missing for a lot of people as far as like those deep friends, like the the quote that you gave. Um, it was a stat that said sixty eight percent of people said they had three or fewer friends. Mm-hmm. Right. So seven out of ten. Yeah. Why is that the case? I think it's a thousand reasons. To be honest with you, I think anybody that says it's just because of this or this is just trying to sell you something. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. I think it's as vast as like the, that talk that you saw was actually double the length and thank God I'm the editorial <laughs> team or y'all would still be there and I'd still be talking. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things I quickly tracked was the journey and mm-hmm. it's everything from move, go West young man. And if you can see somebody's smokestack, they're too close. Right. And so right. we have an ethos of individualism in our culture. That's just who right. we are. We yep. do this. We don't need anybody. We don't need a government. We don't need anybody to tell us what to do. We can do it ourselves. Right. And then we, we morphed that onto scripture, which is, it's not about quote unquote, our people or his people. It's not about who we are as a body. It's about my personal relationship with my personal, right? So we very individualized our faith context. Mm-hmm. And then it became as is, is varied as things like architecture. We mm-hmm. had no air conditioners. And so all of our homes had front porches. And when you have front porches, you got, you're going to see humans yeah. and they just come up and sit by you. Yeah. And then we got air conditioning and we closed the front porch yeah. and we moved a human interaction inside. Well, inside, I'm going to be very, very, very particular about who I let in my house. Mm-hmm. And then we moved to back porches and I'm really going to be particular about who sees my laundry in the floor, my dishes in the sink and comes out back. And now we've just walled it all in and we've played pseudo connection. So we right. now have video games where we talk to one another playing the games or instead of mm-hmm. why in the world would I go to a pay 350 bucks to take my son and his friend to an NFL football game and pay $14 a hot dog and to get like $11 for a, a swig of <laughs> Diet Coke. <laughs> When I can watch it on my 72 inch 4G TV in my living room and go to the bathroom of my own house. Yep. Right. So we have begun to pipe entertainment into our homes. We've just created cocoons that are one stop shops for everything. Now <sighs> we do medical care from home. Right. I love, but one, if you look at some of the medical literature, the moment you make an appointment with a therapist, you actually start getting better. Mm-hmm. It's about little wins. When one of the greatest gifts a doctor can give you, is looking you in the eye and being present with you for 15, 20, 30 minutes and listening to you. And if you'll notice, most doctors have moved to high, high touch. They'll put Mm -hmm. their hands on you when they're examining you. They'll run their hands down your back. There's something about human touch. Mm. At two or three universities ago, when I was an administrator at a university, during the HR onboarding, they recommended the air high five to avoid any sort of unwanted confusion about sexual advances. (laughs) And I remember sitting there going, oh, man, we can't high five. 
just systematically. And that's just, we, we can do this for an hour. Yeah, that's right. incredible. Yep. Just systematically pulled apart being human. Mm-hmm. And we've made it so difficult and so creepy and so weird. Um, right. I had a buddy right. that um, I know this is a marriage podcast, so this is going to sound make me sound awful. But um, <laughs> I had a buddy who was divorced and we were having lunch and I said, uh, he was dating again. I said, all right, tell me about it. And he looked at me and said, <laughs> he smiled and he goes, I don't care what's happening in your house. You make it work. It's crazy out here. <laughs> what he came, he said, you can't just meet somebody and at church or out for dinner. You can't just meet mm. somebody and say hello and sit down, have a conversation, get their number, give them a call. That's considered creepy. That's yeah. considered mm. stalky. Right. What I have to do is learn everything about you via electronic, your, what your curated electronic billboard of yourself. Yeah. And then I got to get to know you that way. And then seven or eight or nine weeks later, then we can go have a human interaction. Mm. And we've just reversed this whole thing on its head, right? So all this is, yeah. there's a million things standing in the way between what us and our poor bodies are screaming for, which yeah. is, please let me sit at the feet of other people and mm. be open and say the words, I'm scared and say the words, I'm worried and say the words, I won, I celebrate with me, yeah. say yeah. the words, hey, will you be here when I can't be here for myself? Will you lift my arms up in the desert? Um, will you come watch my kids? I take my wife to the ER. Will you mm-hmm. please show up? And we simply have outsourced that everywhere. Yes. Mm-hmm. And those are our examples. I'm worried. I'm scared. I'm excited. Yeah. Why those words? Why those? Why does that help people do this? So I, I, I spent a, a lot of time watching behind closed doors. My research was studying people who everybody else goes to for help. And I want to know about their mental health. Hmm. And what I found was the doctors and lawyers and preachers and college presidents, those who have quote unquote made it mm-hmm. are some of the loneliest people on the planet because they spend all of their day with other people coming to them for help. Hmm. And they ultimately implode their bodies scream and to cover up that alarm system, that anxiety that's screaming all the time, you have another drink, you have another drink, or you text somebody you shouldn't text, or you mm-hmm. go out with somebody, even though you're married to somebody else, because it gets your heart rate up a little bit. You like who you become in this new pseudo relationship. You end up doing things that you wouldn't otherwise do. And it's to stop the alarm, stop the ringing, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And so I tried to get to the bottom. What is the connectivity? Like, what, mm-hmm. are, the, what are the nuts and bolts of friendship? And where right. I landed, and it, this isn't, this isn't anything. Someone can tell me five other things and I'd be like, great, that's fantastic. So these aren't <laughs> um, but ultimately I landed on, you have to be able to have people in your life that you can tell them the bad stuff. Mm-hmm. This is not going well. I'm scared about this. Um, I don't want to give my kids vaccines. I don't want to send my kids to a place where kids aren't vaccinated. Like I've got to be able to say that out loud and get that out of my body. Mm-hmm. The second thing, which is, this is the one that was really scary for me. We have to be able to tell people good news and we've got a some zero world that Mm. if I say, Hey, this thing happened at work and it went well, the response you have to give is, Oh yeah. Well, do you know in this country, everybody's like, (laughs) if if something good happens to you, it has to be because it was at the expense of somebody else. Mm. Right. And so we end up holding all of our joys and excitements inside. Mm -hmm. And more importantly, we stop looking for joys and excitements. So we graduate and we're already thinking about when we got to move. No, have a week long. There's a reason why in scripture, like (laughs) weddings were a week. They were a long time. Yep. Everybody in the community is shutting it down and we are going to party till we run out of booze. And hopefully that guy will make more. Right. Now now weddings are 45 minutes. And if it's Mm -hmm. the dance goes too long, everybody gets annoyed Mm -hmm. and their cash bar, bring your own. Right. We've just ruined it all. Right. (laughs) We've just, we've just systematically taken it out of our life. Mm -hmm. I have this memory of walking out of, I forgot the name of the movie. Um, It had uh, Ryan Gosling smoke show number one and it was the jazz movie do y'all remember it where they're playing jazz jazz Uh -uh. Mm -mm. no um it was a great movie it ended well it was it was sad and destructive and all the things that you want (laughs) (laughs) destructive but there's a lot of 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 scenes where he's playing jazz he's a jazz pianist and the Mm -hmm. actress and her name just slipped my mind she's a great actress but they're dancing and they're dating and they fall in love and break up and get back together and they break up i walked out 
And I thought to myself, as me and my wife were holding hands, a very romantic movie, we're walking to the car, and I thought, I just paid two Hollywood actors to spend two hours dancing and falling in love to jazz music. And I could have just taken my wife to a jazz club and danced the night away with her. We have outsourced everything. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't, I'm going to watch a group of strangers in New York live in side by side apartments. And we're going to call the show friends. I'm going to, I'm going to watch them do that for me. So Mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah. I don't have any systems for saying good stuff. Right. And you've got to be able to tell people who hurt you, the dark stuff. Right. right. These are the traumas I've got in my life. This is the pain that I carry. Mm-hmm. Um, we were not designed to carry those burdens alone. And then the mm-hmm. fourth one is you have to have people you share experiences with. Yeah. You got to have people that you do life with on a right. regular basis. And right. You get into turmoil with, you get into craziness with, and you help bail water out of their house when it's flooding and all those. You, you got to look up. I move their couch. <laughs> <laughs> Move your stupid couch over and over. I have look up and say, we've done life together. And whatever right. that looks like. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. those four things ultimately they when your body feels <sighs> that, your body goes, oh, I don't have to be in control of everything because I can't be. So mm-hmm. good. Yeah. Now I can breathe and now I can connect with my wife and my kids and so on and so forth. Mm. It's so in our effort to be safe, we become observers rather than participants in our own life. Right. Yeah. You like back up and I mean, you got to participate some, but you have to let other people participate in your life. Too. Mm. Yes. So we are huge proponents of friendship, both in the marriage and outside the marriage. Yeah. Um, so as you're going through these four components of like what makes a friendship work well and deeply, I'm thinking these apply to marriage as well. Can you talk to the person who says like, my spouse is there for me. I got this. I don't, I don't really need anybody outside of my spouse. Oh, don't ever say, if you ever find yourself saying that, uh, yeah, you need to go to the nearest counselor. Hurry up. Okay, we uh, cut me off if I go too long here, but I think this is important nuance for couples who are married right now. Uh Up until just, uh, uh, and I touch on this a little bit in the book, I think. Um, I should know, right? I wrote it, but so much. I think they edited out like 50,000 words. So I loved all your footnotes of things that probably were in the book that they said, just make that a footnote. <laughs> well, they were like, this has to go. And I was like, it has to stay. And they're like, we'll just duct tape it at the bottom. <laughs> Feeling wire. Um, so up until very, very recently, like very, very recently, you got married for one of two reasons. Your parents were trying to expand their economic or political connections. Right. They were trying to get wealthier. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get 18 goats if I can marry her off. Yep. Mm-hmm. Or if I can get my son to marry that family, then that helps me expand my land. Right. That's number one. Mm-hmm. Or number two. Hey, we're probably only going to live to be about 30 and life's going to be miserable and short. Do you want to do it together? That's, that's why you got married. <laughs> and then I look at my grandparents. Even they were married for 74, 74 years. Wow. 72 years. Wow. Something in wild. The idea of a soulmate was lunacy, Mm. but after 72 years of telling each other the good stuff and the bad stuff and the hard stuff and doing life together, you wake up and that person is breathing your air and they all share lungs and you share hearts and you share Mm. arms and legs. You become soulmates over time. Mm. And what we've tried to do, think about Romeo and Juliet. That is the chief example of our time. For, for starstruck lovers, <laughs> what it yeah. could be like. And if you back out of it, they were two horny teenagers <laughs> that wanted to hook up. So they secretly got married and then murder suicide. <laughs> that's what we have as the ideal, ideal romance. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> it's, mad, it's the worst example you can possibly have. Right? <sighs> so you fast forward to... Tom Cruise looking across the room at Renee Zellweger and saying, you complete me. And now what we're trying to do is reverse engineer soulmate first. Let's build a life second. And that's just not how that math works. Mm. And we used to have our communities were small tribes and we had a binding myth or a binding religion, a binding faith in something. Mm -hmm. And overnight we've pulled the tether and none of us believe we don't believe anything anymore. Right, yeah. right. But we have no 
structures. And so then it was going to be, well, we're defined by where we're born. Like we're Irish and we're like whatever. And we're American. <laughs> and now everybody can move everywhere. Yeah. Right. And so national, like our proximity has unwavered. I mean, has, has untethered. And so we have one last thing and we look at our partner and say, you have to be my safety. You have to be my purpose. You have to meet all of my needs. My Why confidant. You have to be sexy mm-hmm. and hot mm-hmm. until you're 90 because we're going to keep doing it forever. <laughs> all, you have to be a co-earner and a co-parent and a co-dreamer. No human can match the job description we've put on marriage. It, wow. It's impossible. Yeah. Right. And we are both drowning our spouses and we are running from them at the same time. So mm. I actually love this. I love the new expectations on marriage. I actually love them. But I have to be honest about the fact that I don't have the tools yet and I got to learn new stuff. Mm. Mm. And so what my dad, I talk, I know I talk about this in the book. My mom and dad got married in 1970. It was not until 1973 that my mom was legally allowed to go get a checking account without my dad's signature. What? Talk about like women's rights. That, oh, man. That's my mom. Wow. A hundred years ago. Right. Wow. Right. right. 73 when women were given some right. Like you can't deny a woman alone because her husband's not with. Her. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I think about my parents, how they entered their marriage, my mom had to go through my dad to get a checking account to the world they inhabit now. They've been married 50 mm. something years now. Mm. Yeah. For them to make that turn has been extraordinary and remarkable, and it's been painful. And most of us have watched our parents struggle as the ground that they were walking on has shifted underneath them. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is for us as new couples with new rules for marriage, we have to understand that we don't have the skills. We don't have the pictures in front of us. 95% of us don't have the pictures of what it could look like. And that means we got to go learn new things. And the only way you learn new things is sitting by the, at the feet of people who are different than you and who are wiser than you. Community right there. Got to have friends. Yes. Long winded answer to say, I've got to have friends and my wife cannot be everything for me. And if I expect her to, I'm going to drown her. And my husband can't be my trash bin. I can't (sighs) use him for all the crappy stuff that's happening at work. I'm going to bury him. Mm -hmm. I got to have friends that I just tell stuff to. Right. And that's going to make our way through life. That's so good. That was a lot. Sorry. (laughs) No, No, that's fantastic. Uh, If we had 30 more minutes, we could, pick that apart and pull a lot more stuff out of that. Cause that was very, very good and totally agree. 100% with you. Yep. Wow. Dr. Deloney, this has been so enriching and I think people need to go back and listen to it again and take notes. If you listened to and it while you were driving, I'll come back and we'll, we'll unpack whatever you want to unpack. <laughs> Sounds awesome. good. Let's do it. So folks go get the book. We'll put it in the show notes, own your past, change your future. And uh, Dr. Deloney just outlines so much more of the goodness that he gave here in this episode. Also, Dr. Deloney, tell us where people can find you online. One, my mom uh, got her PhD before me and my wife did too. And so there's two powerful, brilliant women who are Dr. Deloney way before me. You can just call me John. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll call you double Dr. Deloney. <laughs> <laughs> my wife was like, is your self-esteem that low? You <laughs> women in your life are more important. Oh, that's hilarious. Um, uh, you can, I'm on the internet at John Deloney. You can follow me there on Instagram and um, you can go to johndeloney.com for the books and cards awesome. and all that kind of stuff. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Okay. Really grateful for you two for putting light out in the world. Thank y'all so, so much. Oh, absolutely. absolutely man. Well, thank Honor you for to link arms. putting all the work that you did yes. into this project to make people's lives better. And we need more people like that. It's, it's so, so necessary. All right, last question. As we close out, we ask every interviewee this question. Rewind back to the first couple years of your marriage. What advice do you wish you would have received? And then fill in the blank, dear young married couple. Oh, man. (laughs) (laughs) My first two years weren't super great. Um, (laughs) Then you'll have a lot of advice. I think a lot of people could echo that. (laughs) we're, we're, We're going to our 20th. Uh, we're, we're celebrating our 20th anniversary next week, actually. Oh, congrats. Um, That's awesome. All right. So what would I tell my young self? <laughs> Dear young married couple, neither of you know everything. Both of you are wrong about most things. <laughs> yes. And the beauty moving forward is how can you be a little less wrong and a little more humble? 
and a lot more connected because that ultimately is the secret. Mm. Wow. Is that good? I just made that up. Is that good? <laughs> Sounds, good. Sounds like you wrote that like a year ago love and you've it. been rehearsing it. <laughs> love it. I was trying to think it. of all the things I quote. Uh, yeah, this oh, is what. So good. Once I just decided I'm going to make my life about serving my wife. Yeah. And once she said, I'm going to make my life about serving this guy. Mm-hmm. I can't express how extraordinary life has become. Mm. Right? Doesn't so, mean so we're, we, we fight. We've almost, I mean, we've hung on by dental floss a few times mm-hmm. over the years. Sure. Right? Barely mm-hmm. made it. But it continues to loop back to, I'll be all in on you if you'll be all in on me. Love it. So, well, you can go forward. So yeah. good. Humility. Mm-hmm. No, pride is the cancer to relationship. Yeah. Ego is, uh, it's, yes, it's cancer. It's all of the things. Yeah. 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 Yep. So yep. true. Well, thank you so much for uh, being on our podcast and speaking all these truths and wisdom. Uh, we, we're very appreciative. All right. Let's all do the Deloney rock on. <laughs> 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 all right, friends. We really hope that you got a ton out of today's conversation. And if you want help, if you want personal guidance, with individual counseling or couples counseling, or even help with you as a couple reaching the goals you have, just reach out. Give us a call at 916-678-1797 or shoot us an email at hello at dearyoungmarriedcouple.com. No matter where you are in the world or in your marriage, we can set up a counseling session with you and we can work toward progress. We also post marriage advice regularly on our Instagram, which is at Dear Young Married Couple, and we'd love for you to join us in conversation there. All right, see you next week.